Turn with me to our lesson for this morning. You find it in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Now listen to the Word of God. <clears throat> now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So is the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask for your understanding, your wisdom. Open our hearts to your message. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. For the most part, when we read stories about Jesus, we recognize that he's surrounded by ordinary people. But not on this night. He's in contact with the aristocracy, Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a very wealthy man and high up in the council for the religious. He was a Pharisee, well respected among the Pharisees. The Pharisee in those days was known among many as the Chabura. And the Chabura were the, were the brotherhood. And they'd swear an oath to this brotherhood. And they'd swear an oath that they would, they would study the law and observe the law and live by the law every moment of their life. They spent all their lives observing every detail of the scribal law. Therefore, they began to develop guidelines that they had to extract from the law because they knew that in the law there must be more. There must be more that God is trying to show to us. In the Bible itself, there is the commandment, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And on that day, no work should be done. That's it. Just that one line. Well, the Pharisees, that wasn't enough. For the Pharisees, they spent hour after hour on what work is, to define work. And they listed the things that may or may not be done on the Sabbath. The Mishnah is a compilation of all those writings and all, the, all that study. It's the result of all their new regulations and rules. It's what I would call the book of loopholes. Because what it is, it's a book that has ways that they can get around the law. The scribes spent their lives working out these rules and these regulations. In the Mishnah itself, you know, I, I mentioned to you in the Bible, it talks about the Sabbath in one verse. In the Mishnah, the section on the Sabbath was 24 chapters on the Sabbath. The things you can and can't do on the Sabbath. Here's an example. To tie a knot on the Sabbath was considered work. Therefore, you can't do that. But a knot had to be defined. 
maybe we could define it in a way that you could tie a knot. Knots of camel drivers or sailors or any type of work-related knots were a no-no. Tying them or untying them, not acceptable. But knots that could be tied or untied by a single hand was legal. So if you could tie a knot or untie a knot with one hand, it's legal. Also, a woman may tie up a slit in her dress or the strings in her cap and those of her girdle. That's acceptable. She could also uh, tie her straps of her shoes or her sandals. But a man who wanted to let down a bucket into a well could not tie a rope to it. But, get this, he could tie it to a woman's girdle and let it down because a knot in a girdle was totally legal. I don't know if the woman would want a bucket tied to her girdle, but... This is the man that Jesus is encountering. A man whose life was filled with rules and regulations on how to fulfill the law. The name Pharisee itself means the separated one. The Pharisees were those who separated themselves from ordinary life in order to keep every detail of the law. So it is interesting that a man like Nicodemus would want to even talk with Jesus. It's amazing that this distinguished religious leader would have anything to do with him. But obviously, he was curious. And he came in the night so that no one would know that he met Jesus. He secretly wanted to question him. It is so amazing that this Jewish aristocrat should come to this homeless prophet who had been a carpenter in Nazareth to talk to him about his soul. It is a miracle of grace that Nicodemus overcame his prejudices, his upbringing, and his whole view of life enough to come and see Jesus. You see, I believe that Nicodemus was struggling. I believe that he was a man lacking something in his life. And though he had all these rules and all these regulations to guide his life, he felt like he was missing something. So he came to Jesus so that somehow in the darkness of night, he might find the light. Maybe Jesus has the answer. I see many a people in my ministry that feel as if they're in the dark. And they come to Jesus because maybe, just maybe, this Jesus has the answer. Maybe he can shed some light on my darkness. I think Nicodemus was a genuine man. Often Pharisees, as we read in the scriptures, came to test and trick Jesus, but this man didn't. He came at night when there was no crowds to impress. Later, John tells us that he defended Jesus to the other leaders, and when Jesus died on the cross, Nicodemus was there, along with Joseph of Arimathea, to bury his body. He was Jewish, born among God's chosen people, heirs of God's promises. Surely, if anyone anywhere was ever a citizen of the kingdom of God, it was Nicodemus. John makes note that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, but he is telling us more than the time. He's giving us a literary hint of Nicodemus' need, coming in the dark to the light. He's a salvation case study. Nicodemus is, is a study of someone who has a, a good, devout, well-born, and sincere as you can be. Here was a man who fully expected to enter the kingdom of God. He had no question that he was going to enter the kingdom of God. And then we have Jesus questioning him about being in the kingdom and about what? Being born again. Nicodemus approaches Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now, not all Pharisees, as sometimes the scripture gives the impression, not all Pharisees were hard-hearted and opposed to Jesus. 
Nicodemus and some of his colleagues had concluded from listening and watching that Jesus was a teacher who, who has come from God, a prophet, in other words. They realized that the miracles Jesus did proved he was God's messenger. Now, we do know that not all Pharisees thought that way. Some attributed Jesus' miracles to Satan, but not Nicodemus. So that dark night, he came to Jesus to learn. He came to listen. In verse 3, Jesus begins his reply to Nicodemus with a kind of alert. He says, truly I tell you, and it signals that Nicodemus should take what Jesus is going to say very seriously. Truly I tell you. Then Jesus tells him that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. This language came out of the blue to Nicodemus. As a man who was thoroughly acquainted with the Old Testament and who was talking to a rabbi, Nicodemus was surely scrambling to think of a, a cross-reference somewhere in the scriptures, born again? There isn't a phrase, born again. In fact, if this had been a, a finish the sentence exercise, no one can see the kingdom of God unless, Nicodemus would have filled in the blank, unless he is circumcised and obeys the laws of Moses not be born again. And let's be born again. Where did that come from? If you're a Jew who obeys God's laws, what other birthright do you need? Born again was completely foreign expression. Nicodemus was actually listening very carefully and openly to Jesus because he doesn't ask the obvious defensive question, why would I need to be born again? I was born right the first time as a Jew. But what he does ask in verse 4 is actually a much deeper question. How can someone be born when they are old? And Nicodemus, Nicodemus then asks, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Now Nicodemus was not being silly and he wasn't trying to poke fun. What he thought he heard Jesus say was that the only hope of entering God's kingdom was a biological redo. And that, of course, is impossible. And that spun his whole world around. But think about it. Our whole culture is used to this phrase, born again. We use it to indicate any fresh start or a new beginning or a remake or a second chance. We're born again. I got a shot again. And for all of those who are Cub fans, it's like the Cubs have been born again. So if he had been talking to us, Jesus might have laid the emphasis carefully to be sure we understood. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born a second time. Not metaphorically, but literally born a second time. A person needs to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. The Jews believed that the reward of a righteous life would be to enter God's kingdom at the end of the age. And Jesus turns that upside down. He's basically saying that you actually could be born again now and see the kingdom of God. Now. You don't have to wait till the end. The shock here is that the only way anyone sees God's kingdom now or ever is to be born into it. Yet no one who has been born once qualifies. I'd be born twice. John has prepared us for this opening verse, for this opening in verses of the gospel. Listen to these words. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Born again. To put it another way, no one gets a passport to God's kingdom. Everyone needs a birth certificate. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that you open our hearts to your spiritual renewal. Show to us how we can see the kingdom every day. In the name of Jesus, we pray.
Amen.